Oh, we're on live, huh? And hey. Non, non 20 to 72 said hello, and so did a friend. <laughs> Hi, my name is Dan Fox. And I'm Brooks Witter. We are going to dig into cognitive behavior therapy, what it's all about, and how you can um, help with your own anxiety and, and depression symptoms using some of these tools. Yeah, crash course, one hour. We'll do it. You'll know everything by the end of an hour. Um, so the, the picture here is just uh, a quick flash on the relationship between thoughts, behavior, and feelings. And uh, cognitive behavior therapy has really looked at this and started to map out some of the uh, ways that our brain um, kind of relates to these different things and how they play a part in each other's uh, experience. Yeah, because we can see that they're all inter... Uh, dependent and interwoven in that our behavior will influence our thoughts, our feelings, and our feelings will influence our behavior and our thoughts and all vice versa. So we're going to learn a little bit about the uh, relationship between those things and really more importantly, some techniques coming from this very uh, research-based approach in human behavior change on how we can actually change our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors in ways to actually just get more of what we want in life. Sound good? That that sounds great. And uh, you know, just looking at the CBT definition, one of the things that is um, significant about this approach is that we're really looking at how our cognitions, how our thoughts, how our cognitive framework or structuring of how we sort of view the world, view ourselves, our beliefs, um, how that kind of creates our thoughts, our emotions, our feelings, and how we can, rather than just be sort of unconsciously ruled by that structure, um, how we can actually be more intentional about it and take some more conscious control over how we want to behave, think, and experience our world. And just to, just to point out, we're going to get a little bit deeper into this, uh, into the presentation, but CBT at this point in the game is somewhat of a generic term that's an umbrella term for a whole family of therapeutic modalities and, and some different theories that all basically are coming out of a behavior and cognitive science tradition that are looking at the interplay between our thoughts, feelings, and behavior. So CBT uh, is somewhat generic and there's a lot of different things like DBT, MBSR, and we'll get more into these later, but I just wanted to name that. So if I wake up in the morning and I'm a little stressed and I take three breaths and say, okay, it's going to be a great day, does that count as a CBT technique? That could that would be a technique found in many CBTs. Okay. Because I, I feel like a lot of the things that we do to sort of psych ourselves up or look on the bright side or, you know, mm -hmm. focus on the positive or, um, you know, things that we might tell our kids are things that could be seen as, you know, something – uh, as part of the cognitive behavioral toolkit and that the interventions aren't sort of exclusive to cognitive behavior therapy. Mm -hmm. They're um, things that we often do anyway, but cognitive behavioral therapy, I think, gives us a map to really understanding what it's mm -hmm. doing and when these tools are the most useful. Yeah. And another indication of cognitive behavioral therapies and how uh, CBT is different from a lot of other treatments is how, uh, well vetted it is in the scientific research. That CBT typically is, it's taught in a lot of the psychology training programs uh, in large part because the universities where this is being taught are research-based and they really uh, are diving into the science of uh, our cognitions and our behaviors and how to change them. So folks, we're gonna <clears throat> spend a few minutes going over some of the kind of basics of how CBT works, what uh, interventions are structured like, uh, the three waves of CBT, and then we're going to be digging into anxiety and depression and some of the strategies for alleviating those symptoms. This is your opportunity. If you have questions, um, you can type them into that chat and we will work those into the conversation and um, address that as it's going so we can make sure we're really hitting your needs and the reason why you uh, tuned in today. <laughs> If they don't type their question now, can they do it at any time? Yes, you can do it at any time. All right. 
Well, I don't know how much we need to dig into this mm -hmm. slide, but it's kind of um, going into more detail about how our thoughts are affecting how we act and feel, how our behavior um, affects our emotions and our thoughts, et cetera. And the, um, the thing that I think is significant for me when I, when I think about this is that usually a thought and a behavior end up tied together in our in our memory in our mind if we're if we're going oh boy like that happened yesterday there's kind of an emotional um connection to the cognition and that those seem fairly automatic mm -hmm. and one of the primary things i think we're trying to do with cognitive therapy is to be aware of those automatic connections the sort of automatic thoughts mm -hmm. and the emotions that kind of automatically follow and um, kind of untie that causal link, untie that sort of automation and be able to have choice. Well said. Because we'll often say, well, of course I yelled at you, I was angry. <laughs> As if because there's anger, the only rational course is to yell. Right, there's, you had right. no other option because I did that to you. Mm -hmm. I made you upset. And we may justify our anger. Well, because you were yelling at me and calling me stupid as if that's just the necessary and uh, obvious precursor to anger. But without recognizing that other people may have very different responses. And so these uh, relationships between thoughts, feelings, and behaviors are not necessarily inherent, but perhaps quite arbitrary and, and based on our own learning as individuals. It, it creates a reality in itself. Yes, yes. And all right, so I, I pulled up this um, comic, right? I'm sure I left the gas on, says these people stranded on the, <laughs> the small desert island um, as an intrusive thought. And I love this one in particular because my father was great at this. When we would leave for school in the morning, I was like 10 or 11, we'd be in the car backing out of the driveway and he'd go, maybe I left the stove on. And I'd say, Dad, um, we had cereal for breakfast. You know, the stove wasn't even <laughs> used, but he had to go mm. and check it. And mm. if I pressed him on the matter, he would say, well, you know, one time I went back in and the stove was on mm -hmm. and the house would burn down. Justification. Justification. Right there. <laughs> right. For right. life of obsessing. <laughs> right. Well, and the house would have burned down. I think it's a, a jumping to some conclusion there. But... Mm -hmm. But it it fed him, and I feel like the the takeaway from this is not so much you know the gas on, which is maybe a sort of trivial annoyance or something that we feel sort of compelled to do, but the impact of that is hopefully not too emotionally weighty. Nevertheless, a lot of intrusive thoughts, a lot of automatic thoughts that are negative, have a much more uh, impactful experience on our day to day mood, our day-to-day -day level of anxiety and depression. Mm -hmm. And it may also be that our day-to-day -day anxiety or depression may be informing which intrusive thoughts show up. So nice. Is, so if we're already in that feeling state, it tends to... Yes. That if we're in a certain feeling state, we're much more likely to have certain thoughts that are associated with that feeling. Okay. And then vice versa. So folks, I hope you're you're kind of getting as we as we take some swings at this, the basics of CBT. Um, you must be because nobody's asked any questions yet, but I hope there's some questions coming about um, anxiety, depression, and how we can really work with that. So negative thinking is something that we all do. In in fact, I feel like there's a part of our brain that is just kind of its job is to sort of scan the horizon of our life, figure out what there is to worry about, and then start kind of worrying about it. And, and we do this sort of automatically. And, and a lot of times it has this functional thing. It keeps us from sort of getting in trouble or missing out on some problem that might be coming down the road. But um, a lot of times it becomes an impediment because we can't turn it off and it creates a biological stressed state that is not functional for us as a baseline. Yeah, and uh, do we want to go into the negativity bias? Is that yes, helpful? Yes, yes. Yeah, little, we're kind of weaving a little bit in here, but we as a, as an organism, 
as a living creature, we have built into us a survival mechanism that prioritizes paying attention to threats, right? Yes. If it's a threat, it's possibly going to kill us or make us make our lives really difficult. So we need to pay a lot of attention to that in order to survive. And so negative thoughts, and when we get stuck into patterns of negative thinking, we're often really a, a victim of a survival mechanism that has served purpose in our evolution when those threats are outside of us. Uh, it's going to be too cold. We need to hunt. We need to get food to hunt and to, to uh, solve our hunger issues. Um, but now with a lot of the survival needs taken care of, that same mechanism of paying attention to threats is still active, but now it's turning into our the cognitions and the threats to the the sort of abstract qualities of our maybe social survival, those those threats being to status, uh, social cohesion, connection, uh, prestige, and whatnot. So just that just to, it's good to know that built into our nervous system is this thing that prioritizes uh, negative thoughts. Right, right. So it's not it's not pathological per se. It's not bad when we have that. Yes. Yeah. It's part of our DNA, mm -hmm. so to speak. So here's one of the things I really like about cognitive behavior therapy is that we really drill down into what our thoughts are and they there's a framework for understanding um, some of the ways that we distort reality. Um, this is from David Byrne's uh, great book, Feeling Good. And there are more cognitive distortions than these, but uh, this is 10 of them. And it's really helpful to be able to look at our thoughts from the perspective of a being who has a thought so that we don't have to feel like we are our thoughts, but we are a person who's experiencing this mind that kind of generates thinking constantly. And sometimes that thinking is really stable and steady and strong and um, kind of on point in terms of being sort of connected with reality and not magical thinking. And other times um, when we're anxious and distressed and depressed, um, the cognitive distortions uh, like the ones that are listed here come up more and we've got to figure out how to deal with them. So one of the things I really like about uh, this approach for anxiety and depression, and this, by the way, we won't get too much into the research, but um, CBT strategies have been shown to be as effective as medication. And the only therapy that is uh, as effective as, as medication for anxiety and depression. And part of why I, I think that it is so helpful is because we all can use these strategies day to day in the moment to work with our thoughts and be able to um, feel a sense of confidence and have strategies that actually work mm -hmm. to help us influence our thoughts, behaviors, and feelings rather than just being kind of overwhelmed by them. Mm -hmm. And it starts here, being able to have a kind of meta framework for looking at our thinking, and in particular, our distressed thoughts. So. Um, uh, an assignment might be if you're in uh, therapy to write down during the week some of the things that are causing you know great anxiety or, or feelings of depression it might be on a scale of one to ten and you write down those thoughts and then later come back to those looking and seeing all right does this fit any of these distorted thinking categories and what might be a more functional and honest authentic sort of in touch with the truth of reality. Not that we're just trying to make a sort of arbitrarily positive worldview that's mm -hmm. not connected with the world, mm -hmm. but that we also don't want to be in this arbitrarily negative, cognitively distorted worldview. We're trying to um, not let that negative bias that we tend to have really uh, rule our thoughts, feelings, and emotions. Yeah, so I want to invite you now, because we did say we would do some techniques, right? And we just talked about some techniques. Let's, Let's do, do it. it. Let's All do right. it. So why don't you, if you have a piece of paper uh, and a pen, just write down some of the troubling thoughts that you've been aware of today. You may have some of these thoughts today. It's Wednesday, November 9th, 
Um, do you want to put them into the chat, or is that? Uh... Oh, um, no, you don't need to put them into the chat. I just want you to write three, three or four thoughts that you've struggled with today. OK. And now see if you can just, with each of those thoughts, just identify if they fall into one of the categories of the 10 that are on this slide. Oh my gosh, I'm such a great fortune teller. <laughs> I'm looking at 5B already. Like I just, I'm so mm -hmm. good at, at just being like, oh, yeah. this is going to be a mess. Look at this. Yeah, yeah. I like to call that guy like my, my, my weatherman. Your weatherman. Because okay. he's predicting the future, but he's often wrong. <laughs> that, yeah. Versus yeah. I, eliminating the CBT approach of <laughs> dividing your mind into different personalities. <laughs> well, that's another technique. We could get into that later. It's it's advanced. It's advanced. <laughs> yeah. I get into catastrophizing, um, but it's not on there. Maybe overgeneral. Mm, yeah, maybe overgeneralization could be a version of catastrophizing. Well, and this isn't a, an exhaustive list. I, I yeah. would uh, urge people to go to um, mm -hmm. check out that Feeling Good book if they're really into this as a practice. I think that's yeah. where the real strength of this comes in. It's not just sort of an intellectual truth that we touch on once, but it's more of a way to day-to-day -to -day work with our thoughts so that yeah. we're not just kind of subject to being overwhelmed by the ups and downs. One thing I often tell my clients is, and tell myself actually, is your mind is not a great friend. It can be quite fickle. And particularly when we're struggling with anxiety and depression, our mind is actually, can be quite a bully and can say and give us all sorts of stories and opinions and judgments about ourselves and the world that are incredibly mean, uh, unhelpful, rude, uh, and it's really not being a good friend. And so one of the ways that I see the practice of CBT uh, being is developing a relationship with your mind such that you're able to cultivate uh, a discriminating awareness about when your mind is offering you things that are helpful and when your mind is offering things that are unhelpful. And many of these things on the cognitive distortion table are unhelpful. Some of them might be helpful in certain contexts, but that's one of the things that we would be developing as a skill in CBT, is our ability to take that perspective, discriminate our thinking patterns, and notice if it's helpful or unhelpful. And if it's unhelpful, then we do some other work about uh, developing some flexibility to step outside of that thought stream and step into another one that may be more helpful. Nice. So that's a perfect lead into um, talking about the different kinds of interventions that uh, are done in general. Um, certainly, you know, this is at the level of imagery and imagery is a, a great uh, resource for us being able to um, think through and rehearse stressful situations or things where um, we, we might feel like we are emotionally volatile and we try to imagine ourselves in a better um, in a better place. And a lot of this is really trying to map out sort of where, where do our thought patterns and our emotional um, patterns go to and where are these stressful experiences? And here, of course, is Humpty Dumpty um, with this trauma that he keeps sort of having to worry about because it's, it's happened and it's now all consuming him. Mm -hmm. And if you're interested in more of this, the psychology of performance, there's a lot of research in psychology of performance about um, mental rehearsals and visualizations and how effective it can be in actually getting different outcomes in our life. Can I dig into an example? Yes. So um, oftentimes in middle school, there's a tremendous amount of anxiety that kids start to experience because their capacity to think and experience emotion is greater and the school system is less nurturing the way like one primary classroom um, in the elementary school system is more sort of nurturing community based. So we get a lot of anxiety for middle schoolers and it's really hard as a sort of new experience for them to kind of figure out how to work with it. Um, I found tremendous success with having kids and we can do this as adults too. I certainly do this for myself. Um, 
be able to ahead of time think about experiences that they've had in the past where they've felt confident, excited, successful. And um, you know, an example might be when somebody is doing something athletic, um, skiing down the mountain, maybe it's a specific time, which is helpful. The more sort of sensory rich we get the experience, the better. So we we can have the person think about that time where they were very successful and what the snow felt like and the sounds that they were hearing and to um, really bring in the emotional experience of that confidence and that success. And one option, this is something that I've often used with kids who wake up stressed for school, is to come up with three scenarios like that and to spend a minute going through that scenario as if they were re-experiencing it in real time, and then take a few breaths, then do the next one, take a few breaths, then do the final one. And all we're doing is trying to give our mind a script to follow to get out of the gate at a time that is classically difficult, where in fact, they have a script to follow. It's just a negative one that they didn't intentionally settle upon. It's just kind of started to generate itself as a habit. And we're trying to replace that sort of unconscious, intrusive, negative thinking with something that is going to be much more helpful to them and remind them about, okay, here are these times where I felt confident and successful, or I was out in a social experience and I felt successful. And I can imagine that and remember that and use that visualization as a way to feel the experience again. Mm -hmm. And from that, be able to move into my day instead of feeling ah, this, you know, the sort of biological response to anxiety. Mm -hmm. I really like what you said, Dan, about, you know, we have a, we have scripts that we're following all the time. And the question is, are those scripts working for us? And it sounds like what you're saying is if not, then it's, it's, it's a process that we can engage intentionally to find some new scripts that may put us into a frame of mind and a frame of uh, emotional experience that could be more conducive to meeting the challenges that are in front of us. I think that's great. And I, and I think it's such a good thing to watch our, our sort of unconscious scripts and see if they're healthy or not. Because I find that as adults, most of us are good at when we're stressed, when we're getting anxious, we tend to self-correct in the wrong direction. We don't do self-care nurturing things as much as we try to push ourselves harder and harder mm -hmm. to a breaking point. Mm -hmm. Cool. So um, this slide is just about the classic uh, CBT intervention steps. There's, um, it's sort of delineated as four here, but the idea is that we're really trying to get clear on what we're working on and trying to accomplish in therapy. So we're identifying the, the challenging behaviors. We're trying to figure out, is the behavior something that is happening in excess or in, in a deficit and then looking for a baseline, evaluating, you know, the frequency and intensity. And then we're looking for um, what are the actual steps to, you know, decrease the intensity, frequency, duration, or vice versa to increase it. So it's, it's a way of really breaking down almost into like a scientific experiment. Like, you know, here's the goal, try this intervention, see what happens um, in terms of our thoughts and emotions. And that um, approach is something that often makes CBT uh, a practice in the office that can be more short term. You know, we're not doing a sort of uh, deep seated and remember your childhood kind of years and years thing. It's, it's often, you know, figuring out some strategies to use, practicing them in the office, uh, doing some homework, and then coming back and reporting on how it worked and troubleshooting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, no, I think we can move on and get, get into this. In, we're gonna have more of a discussion time at the end, right? Yes. All right. Excellent. Okay. <clears throat> so, all right. I love this slide because this is not actually what we're trying to do with our cognitive restructuring, right? We're, we're looking at a situation here where um, somebody's saying to Pinocchio and to, I don't know what witch it is and, and to Rudolph that um, there's nothing wrong with your noses, right? So, so you don't have to actually feel bad or um, something about something you're self-conscious of. And that's not what we're advocating for therapeutically with cognitive behavioral therapy. We are, we are looking for something that is actually 
um, going to feel authentically true. It's not just magical positive thinking, but it's something that sort of passes the sniff test of reality in our core beliefs. Because if we're just trying to convince ourselves of something that at our core we know is not true or that the world sort of reflects back to us is not true, it doesn't actually um, have the benefit that we're, that we're looking for. Mm -hmm. So a cognitive restructuring on this might look like something, well, well, my nose may be unique and different, but it's... It saves Santa. <laughs> it does save Santa, right? And it helps me be honest. And it helps me be honest, right? My nose helps me be honest. So... Right, so, so finding, finding uh, a way to maybe put an area of concern into a frame of value. So let's look at this from uh, the depression experience and the thoughts that we often see with depression of, you know, nothing that I try is going to matter, so why bother anyway? This I feel like is a little more challenging because somebody who is anxious often has the energy to try a lot of interventions, but when we're depressed, it's like, uh, I know I could go for a run or I know I could clean my house, but I just don't feel like it. So Boy. fix that. How do we fix that? <laughs> Boy, I, I take this on from a different approach, which we'll get into later. But um, so here's this, here's this thought that's keeping you in bed. Nothing I do is going to matter. So why do anything anyway? Right? Yep. This is, and, and then you just kind of pull the covers over and just, I'm just going to sleep away the rest of the day to put on my Netflix and just wallow and just be here. Right. Or, depression. you know, my therapist tells me all I need to do is wake up and go to the gym for a half hour mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. then, then I'll be fine. Yeah. Well, that therapist is making a lot of promises, <laughs> <laughs> which, we'll get, into later, which we'll get into later. But what we're looking to do is actually, okay, so let's say um, going to the gym is actually a value to the client, that they want to be healthy, they want to be vit vital, it's important that they take care of their health. Okay. But they're so depressed that and feel like they're under the weight of oppression of the thought, nothing I do is going to matter, so why do anything? Okay. Let's do an experiment right here, okay. right now, okay? Because CBT says there's a relationship between our thoughts and our behavior, right, and our yes. feelings. Yes. So we feel low energy, depressed. We have thoughts that keep us low energy. Nothing I do is going to matter, so why do anything? Just stay down. And so then we act. That's a rationale, right? Yes. Okay, it makes sense. So what if we were to just, rather than change the thought, let's change the relationship that we have to the thought, right? We talked earlier about part of this is actually developing a relationship with our mind that we can see what's helpful, what's not helpful, and then learn to unhook, right? Yes. So is the thought nothing I do is going to matter anyway. So why do anything? If we're wanting to have more health and vitality in life, is that thought helpful in meeting that end? No. Right? It keeps us down. It keeps us away from the activities that historically provide health and vitality, give us opportunity to connect with other people, all that stuff. Right. Okay. So unhelpful. So um, traditional CBT might say, well, we need to replace the thought. I'm going to take a different tack and say, we need to change the relationship to that thought. Okay. Okay. So it's so not the, about never thinking about these automatic. Yeah. Thoughts. I'm going to say that the thought isn't the enemy here. It's the relationship to the thought that buys that thought and believes it and then follows it as a justification and rationale for not doing anything. Okay. Okay. So everybody at home or at work or wherever you are, um, hopefully not driving. This, this won't <laughs> Don't work do so this well activity if you're driving. while driving. So, if you're sitting down, uh, this will work great. So have the thought, I don't want to stand up. Standing up is pointless. What's the use? I don't want to stand it. up. Standing up is pointless. What's the use? Yes. Okay. Hold that thought in your mind as if it's so crystal clear. And this is, this is a true thought. Uh, standing up right now is pointless. Yeah. And okay. my hip hurts. So. All right. So now what I want you I'm to do. I'm going to do it is try to stand up while holding that thought. Uh, okay. Do I actually do this? Yes, I keep holding the thought, yep, okay. do it. All right, excellent. 
So Dan is now standing. Hopefully, many of you at home are as well. Okay, so this is kind of a silly exercise, but a profound one in the sense that what it does is it demonstrates that there's a you that can relate to your thoughts, that can do something different from you, what your thoughts are telling you. Your thoughts are not causative, and no matter how much your thoughts make sense, if they're not helpful, then we've got to find a way to step around and act in despite despite our thoughts right okay so we're like relate we're the being that has the thoughts as opposed to just the thoughts exactly exactly um uh well here's another sort of this is not the <laughs> the correct approach right for for our mm -hmm. kind of restructuring um we're we're trying to figure out how to not just you know imagine ourselves into feeling blissful but to really connect into our lives and our inner and outer world in a way that's effective i don't really want to get into doing homework um this this slide is about how our core beliefs are kind of tied into our thoughts about ourselves and our future and other people and one of the things that uh we've found with some of the brain studies about what we do when we're thinking is that a lot of times when we're just sort of ruminating about ourselves in relationship to other people and in relationship to the future, that it's not actually um, functional. It stresses us out and we're not making plans and strategizing and reflecting the way we would if we were activating our frontal lobes. We're just sort of in different parts of our brain where we're kind of ruminating and worrying without any real problem solving. So part of the strategies of cognitive behavioral therapy are trying to figure out what are those core beliefs about ourselves and other people in the future and how are they serving us or, or not serving us and how do we actually um, really get in touch with them because some of them are so sort of deep, it's like a fish in water where it's hard to really see how we're affected by a belief because it seems like a truth that's so obvious that it's not even questioned. Yeah. And Dan, do you find that some of these core beliefs, we may believe them, but at times we may wish we didn't believe them, that we, we don't want to believe them. Like if it's a negative belief about oneself, like uh, I'm weak and nobody likes me. Right. I'm, I'm never going right? to get into a relationship. I'm never, I'm never going to get into a relationship. We may believe that, but in, we may even get into a relationship which belies that belief, but the belief is still sort of there. Right, right, right. Well, and I feel like beliefs also um, are really good at discounting new information. So if I feel mm -hmm. like mm, I'm not going to get into a relationship and you say to me, oh, no, you know, like I've seen the way you talk mm -hmm. to people and you're very charismatic mm -hmm. and I think mm -hmm. you have a lot of qualities that would make people attracted to you. I will be sort of thinking in the back of my head, uh, Brooks doesn't really know what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. He's just saying that to be nice, mm -hmm. stuff like that, that just kind of discounts your um, input and, yeah. and confirms to my belief. Mm -hmm. And that's often automatic, right? It's not even a choice that right. I'm doing that. It's just my thoughts kind of aligning with what I feel like I know to be true. Right. If anybody out there has ever been in an argument with someone you love and the argument got pretty heated because you were pretty committed to being right and you sacrificed being happy and you just kept making your point trying to force this person to see that you were right and it kind of uh undermined some of the trust in the relationship made it kind of yucky to be there you know how powerful it is the impulse for us to be right. So for as another little experiment here, if you can write down one uh, core belief or fear, I kind of call them core beliefs or fears about yourself, that a judgment that is common that you're aware of. Uh, for me, it's sort of like, I'm kind of lazy, right? Um, if Look at that belief and if that belief weren't true, who would be wrong? 
who would be made wrong by that not being true? You. Right. So <laughs> that's the case. I would be made wrong if that weren't true. And yet I'm, I often am very much invested in being right at the expense of my own happiness because we actually don't want to be wrong. It's pretty threatening to be wrong also. So then we can start to see where, you know, these core beliefs can really paint us into a corner when they're not serving us, but abandoning them means that we have to admit that we're wrong and we're mm. quite fallible. There was this book I read in my twenties called you can heal your life mm. by Louise Hay, I think. Yeah. And classic. Um, and or Louise May, Louise Hay. I think it's Hay. Hay. Um, and at the end of every chapter, she had this like uh, sort of like a, a verse or a, a saying that you could tell yourself to kind of be sort of focused on the positive and mm. and it was kind of a healthy way to start your day. The idea was to sort of you know come back to this as a almost like a, a prayer for your mm. day. Like an and, affirmation mantra. Yes, an affirmation mantra. And it was um I think one of the reasons why that book was so successful was that people use that and it worked like it's actually helpful to find some sort of affirmation phrases that um, are personally meaningful to you and to allow yourself to think about it mm -hmm. and and focus on that in a regular way during the day during your weeks that would be an interesting experiment considering what you said earlier in this that we uh we will discount in competing information that that competes or uh that uh proves, invalidates invalidates a core belief we also have a, a confirmation bias where we seek out information that that does validate it right and so if you're trying on a different affirmation it would be interesting to see if you were also looking for uh experiences moments in your day interactions that you have that would affirm the affirmation and validate that information, in which case you're then getting a much more rounded out picture of the complexity and the multivalenced nature of self. I three. like multivalenced. That's a great word. <laughs> uh, do you want to dig into the three waves? Because oh yeah, we like... can we, we yeah, we can get into this. Brooks is like an expert at ACT, which we'll hear about in wave three. So, you know, I think you know a lot about the history of what's going on with cognitive behavioral thinking. Yeah, so um, cognitive behavioral therapy is situated in the family of behavioral therapy. And we can look at sort of three main waves, the big kind of paradigm shifts in the evolution of behavioral therapy. Uh, wave one was sort of classic behaviorism, really looking at the uh, sort of animal behavior and I really only seeing, only looking at the observable phenomena that could be measured by an external observer, the scientist. So no thoughts, no feelings were relevant to uh, learning theories in wave one behaviorism. All of a sudden, and then, but that presented a problem where humans were quite different from animals in the lab. We responded differently. We had different vulnerabilities. We had different strengths, obviously. And there was this sort of uh, question of how do we incorporate what we know is influencing human behavior, which is our thoughts and feelings, the inner life. How do we incorporate that into a science of uh, understanding phenomena that we can observe empirically? <clears throat> um, so anyway, Aaron Beck brought in a whole stream of cognitive science into the behavioral therapy uh, literature and the the under the purview of uh, behavioral therapy and created cognitive behavioral therapies. Um, his view is pretty dominant uh, for about 30 years, 40 years. It's still very, very prevalent. And uh, but what is happening now in the field of CBTs is a third wave. Um, and that you can see there's ACT, DBT, uh, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, um, where the third wave is saying, hey, maybe it's not so much that the thoughts that we have are causing our behaviors and 
uh, where traditional or second wave CBT says, well, let's just change out the bad thoughts, we'll dispute it, we'll get rid of it, and we'll, we'll put the good thoughts in. Third wave says, well, we can't really get rid of thoughts, but what we can do is change our relationship to the thinking so that we can establish uh, an allegiance with an aspect of ourselves that is able to step outside of the stream of thought and feeling and take perspective on that. This is like what we did with these, uh, I can't stand up, but you actually do stand up. Yep. So there's a part of you that can observe the thought and act irrespective of what the thought is telling you to do. You don't need to change the thought in order to change the behavior. You just need to change your relationship to the thinking, to the feeling in order, to, and then behave differently. So we should apply that to the question from one of our viewers, uh, Jan Hittleman, who is experiencing post-election oh, depression P and anxiety. E and now his relationship to his thoughts is that his thoughts are actually logical. So mm -hmm. it's like how to get a more functional thought if he feels like his thoughts are already right. Um, this, is, this becomes problematic because in second wave uh, CBT, it's all about, is this logical or is this illogical? Well, in second wave CBT, I would say, Jen, just think of a time that you were like boogie boarding in the ocean and just visualize that constantly and find your bliss place. Mm -hmm. And anytime you have anxiety or depression um, and you notice it, you know, go to a trigger that's going to bring you to a better state of mind. Right. Which is seeing the depression and anxiety as an enemy that we need to subdue and get away from. So in a third wave, let's look at this from a third wave perspective. And I'll just look at it from an act perspective. Okay. So from an act perspective, Jan, I would ask you, well, what is this, what are these thoughts? What are the, what is the challenge here telling you about what's important? And it may be that some of your anxiety and depression about the election or that you have values that you feel are threatened and there's a fear of a society that will treat people differently from how you would want them to be treated. And so from this perspective, we can look at what's, what's actually important here in terms of your uh, living your best life, living a life that's in alignment with your core values. And let's find those thoughts and let's find those uh, strategies that are going to be helpful in developing a more value rich repertoire of behavior. Because in our post election depression and anxiety, one response to that is like the world is going to, to pot and there's nothing I can do about it. And I'm just going to watch Netflix for the next four years and wake me up when the next national election happens. That would be one way, one response that we could have to fearing that when we look outside in the world, it's going to give us a reflection that we don't want to see. It's going to give us all sorts of pain and fear and distress. And yet that wouldn't be a response that would be conducive to actually connecting with a sense of vitality and purpose and a sense of agency that you actually can respond in a functional way to the challenges of the world. And if you can actually respond functionally to challenges, you are going to be in a much better place. And we know this, there's a lot of behavioral learning about this, that if you have a sense of control and agency, then your, your experience of distress goes down significantly. Um, so even though your thoughts may be logical, the question is now, what do we do? Where does it fit in to tell Jan he's got to go on a bike ride for like 20 miles? Oh, I think that, I think Dan, I think Jan should definitely go on bike rides. Because, every, every morning and then he'll be cured. Well, will he be cured? Oops, that gets back to our earlier <laughs> right? therapist intervention. The, the election results will still hold. Yeah. So the question is, Jan, what, what do you want in your life and what's going to be helpful for you to get to move in that direction. And what does this anxiety and this depression tell you about what's most meaningful, what matters to you, the values that you hold, the vision that you have for our society, for your loved ones, for 
the next generation? And is there a way that we can uh, develop strategies that take those values newly clarified and do some uh, goal setting and some activity building so that you can actually derive more of that value in your life? Ah, the polygraph. Speaking of <laughs> anxiety, gears right? From, right. Mm. All right. So one of the uh, one of the really cool things about the third wave of cognitive behavioral therapy is that we're not looking at our experience, whether those are thoughts or feelings, as an enemy that we need to subdue and get rid of. Rather, it's you know, like we were talking about earlier, it's rather it's uh, it's like this process that we need to make friends with. We need to become familiar with and we need to learn how to open to. So we're going to do a thought experiment here, giving you a sense of sort of, you know, why would we take this different approach? It seemed like CBT is working as good as medications. Why, why change it? So here's a little thought experiment. So imagine that you're hooked up to the world's most sensitive polygraph. And it's going to measure any change in your baseline level of anxiety. And I'm going to know, and, and imagine you're sitting in this room with me, and I'm, or I'm there with you. Hooked up to this polygraph. I'm going to give you one job and one job only to do. And this job is to not get anxious. It's super important that you learn how to control your anxiety here because we all know what happens if you don't. So in order to motivate you to learn this one simple thing, if you do get anxious, I'm going to shoot you with a pistol. <laughs> That's great motivation. <laughs> right? Right? It's an awful setup. I'll just go there, right? It's a horrible setup. And yet this is a, this is a setup that actually happens from a lot of the um, ways that we typically and very reasonably approach problematic feelings like depression and anxiety. The, the setup is, okay, anxiety is a problem. Yes. I shouldn't have it. I should be able to control it. If it shows up and I can't control it, that's a really big problem. And even worse things are going to happen. Yes. Right? So if I do get anxious, I'm going to get shot. I'm going to lose my, I'm going to lose my job. I'm going to fail at this uh, presentation and it'll just pr be proof that I'm just a despicable schmuck. Right. It's going to just get worse. So in this situation, in this scenario, what we have control of is really, we don't have control of our anxiety. And the, and the problem is the more we're trying to control it, the more, the higher the stakes are in our need to control it, the less likely we are to actually get it under control. For sure. In the moment, I'm totally with you, but couldn't we do some sort of Beckian approach and go, um, you know, think happy thoughts and run around a lot before your stressful activity so that you reduce anxiety. Like, can't we learn about techniques that reduce our anxiety and then use them rather than just going, well, it's inevitable. Oh, sure. There's no control. <clears throat> we got to. So, yeah. So we can definitely learn how to uh, do things that are going to be helpful in managing our anxiety. But at the basic level, we have to be willing to tolerate anxiety and recognize it as a natural, uh, a natural process of living a meaningful life in order for it to not become so problematic that it cripples our ability to actually move towards anything meaningful because anxiety will show up. So if we, if we have the belief that anxiety can't show up, anxiety can't be here, if it is, it's going to be prob it's going to be a big problem for me. That is a problematic frame that is a recipe for creating anxiety. So if, if Aaron Beck is saying, oh, I know how to fix this anxiety, the implicit message is anxiety is a problem. But if the message is, you know what, before doing something that brings up a lot of anxiety, it might be interesting to see if feeling your feet firmly planted on the floor, taking a few small, slow, measured breaths, uh, going for a run, 
let's experiment with seeing how you can get flexible with anxiety as opposed to how you can become an exterminator of anxiety. Hmm. I like that. Okay. I still sort of feel my inherent bias as to wanting to get rid of it because it feels right. more comfortable. I feel more comfortable right. when not being anxious. Right. We all do. Right. Anxiety is a, is an activated aroused state, which primes us for taking some protective measures. Right. right? It's like, it's not comfortable. So we want to do something to get to do, to deal with the threat so we can get back to a place of comfort. So it's completely reasonable. The problem is that when the threats are all internal, you know, like we can have sort of intrusive thought that we then get anxious about. And then if we see that ang that anxiety is a problem, we, we become anxious about our anxiety. In which case it's this feedback loop that just spirals up out of control. I see. Okay. Does that make sense? So let's say I'm going into a, uh, an exam that I feel a lot of stress about because there's, mm -hmm. you know, consequences. Yeah. Um, and I have a belief that if I'm anxious, I'm going to perform worse because anxiety keeps the brain from being able to access its problem solving and logical thinking mm -hmm. parts. Um, what do I do? Don't I want to have some sort of visualization and a few affirmations to like, go in there with me like, I got this, like, it's mm -hmm. gonna be okay, you know, I've studied or whatever, mm -hmm. like, you know, just some, some stuff to kind of like, psych myself up. Yeah. So I think I think, so you're asking about how do I deal there's the there's the feeling. And then there's the thought, right? Yes. And then there's a question of behavior, what's going to be? How can I relate to my thoughts and feelings so that I can get optimal behavior in this context? Right? And so I think it's, uh, and the research shows that, yeah, it can be really helpful to have a number of other thoughts that we can go to that might uh, provide us with greater flexibility so that we can focus on our performance as opposed to focusing on our anxiety, right? Because often what, you're, what happens is when we get anxious and we see anxiety as a problem, our resources are going to turn inward and we're going to become, we're going we're gonna to marshal our resources to get rid of anxiety. Yep. And if we are spending 50 minutes doing that and not taking the test, well, then all of a sudden our anxiety has created the outcome that it feared. Yes. Right. So if we can actually identify the core belief that's operating in that situation, they're like, oh, my anxiety is my anxiety is a problem and it's going to keep me from getting a good grade. And if I don't get a good grade, I'm going to be a failure. I'm a failure. Right. If we can identify that, you might want to write that out. <laughs> we'll have done some work with this in, in our CBT session, identifying those beliefs, and then looking at like looking at some other beliefs that may be more helpful, right? So you can start to recognize, oh, this is a really unhelpful belief. It elicits a lot of feelings. It's a powerful one, and I'm aware of it. I, I am having the thought as opposed to the thought having me. So if we can identify it, see it for what it is, which is a, a thought that comes from our own history of having perfectionistic parents or whatever, and then see, well, what might be more helpful thoughts? It might be um, feel your feet on the floor and do the best you can. Okay. Right. Uh, pay attention to what the question is asking. We might right. generate a whole host of more adaptive thoughts that we can then switch our attention to and see if it's actually holding those thoughts are more helpful. Yep. And this is something that I, I like that you said, you know, in therapy, we would be working on that because it definitely is a practice that is best done outside of the intensity of the moment, right? Once we're sort of in crisis mode, taking yeah. the test or in a socially anxious situation to develop in that moment, your cognitive strategies, the thoughts that you're going to go to is a heroic task. Mm -hmm. So we want to have, you know, done that work ahead of time and practiced in uh, similar but less intense situations so that we can mm -hmm. we kind of have it in our bones as a strategy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and a lot of times the, the anxiety cues are cues for more anxiety. 
right? You feel anxiety coming on and then you get anxious. And so a lot of times what we'll be working on, and I'll recommend this to people in the audience, is that when we recognize a cue, one of the feelings that are associated with a problematic core belief, when we feel those cues, it can be really helpful to develop a new relationship with those cues where rather than just shooting straight up into our head and where we're then engaging in a lot of uh, cognitive distortions, instead dropping down and just bringing a mindful awareness to the feelings themselves, where then you're able to develop a sort of a, a bigger container for the feelings of anxiety to, to run their course as opposed to sort of keeping them in an echo chamber where every cue just elicits more and more anxiety. Okay. So we got a great question here, which I, I totally relate to, which is, you know, this is dealing with depression, right? If, if we've got some strategies that we recommend that have this level of energy that needs to be in place to be able to do these strategies, how do we overcome that sense of ennui that like, just, we can't really, dig it up to get out of bed or to do the work or to, you know, go exercise or make a list of things that I'm going to do today to, you know, feel better. Um, I'm, I'm so with this question yeah. because I, I feel like this is why um, anxiety seems like there's this sort of potential energy that is ready to get sprung. We have energy and depression often feels like there's an emptiness of that energy. And if somebody's telling me, Oh, action is the antidote to depression. It's like, well, right, yeah, but yeah. like, nice try. Yeah, that's not happening. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, you know, to your point, the depression, it, there's there's a lot of it's inertia, uh, and and energy that is stayed, and it's hard to get moving, and. One of the gold standards from the research for depression is behavioral activation, but it's a chicken and egg in terms of marshalling the energy required to, to get out the door, to get your shoes on, to do something. And from the behavior language, that's a, that's a process of shaping. And one of the things that, in, by shaping, I mean sort of starting with small steps and moving towards the target, which might be to go to the gym for half an hour a day, but it might start with, Put on your put on your running shoes, and that's it. But one of the things that is uh, problematic in maintaining depression is the way that we relate to our depression, the thinking errors, thinking strategies that we engage in that serve to reinforce a depressed state, where we're buying into the kind of toxic thought stream that our minds give us about ourselves, about the world, about the futility of hope. Um, as we're buying into all of that, we tend to notice that our energy becomes more depressed. And one of the things about depression is like, it's always like this. It's always just this numb fog blah, which is an eternalization. And so, one thing that's really helpful is to really step out of that thought and question it with your experience and look for slight variations in the texture of experience and get curious about, oh, after I shower, I have a little bit more energy. And that might be a, a cue or a, a way in to develop some strategies that are going to be looking at how do we uh, sort of increase the line of that upward curve in terms of our energy. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, final thought. I know we're, we're about out of time, but I feel like, um, you know, the Netflix solution, right? I'm depressed. I'm going to watch Netflix mm -hmm. that there's, there's sort of a short term and a long term view to alleviation of depressed symptoms or anxiety symptoms. And a lot of times there are short term, um, escapes, with uh, technology or whatever somebody's you know addictive choices that does give the temporary relief and sometimes I'm all for that I think if if you can do that without um, too much of the negative whatever the the downsides behaviorally would be or really the downsides long term right a lot of times our short term 
escapes from uncomfortable feelings, difficult thoughts and emotions are uh, behaviors that creates longer term problem, like greater issues down the road. So, you know, something like Netflix, I think, though there is, you know, certainly research out there that shows that the more we're um, doing stuff like that online, it hits a threshold where it starts to feel depressing and we have less motivation and that kind of thing. Um, in terms of the short term benefit, oftentimes it's pretty good and it outweighs the, the long term costs mm -hmm. where there's much more extreme escapes that are uh, mm -hmm. more dangerous long term. Yeah. Well, we just got a question at the buzzer. Uh, follow up for teens and CBT interventions that are effective for middle school kids, please. I, I think one thing we can say about that is that um, in the last webinar, there was also a request to get into middle schoolers and um, the social stress and social challenges that they face. So um, we are going to be doing that in the spring and we can look to incorporate um, a lot of what we've been talking about through the lens of adolescence during that workshop. Mm -hmm. And just the one that you did with one example earlier in the webinar um, about the morning and developing a new script, uh, building on moments of uh, meeting challenges with confidence. Uh, so, yeah, I think it's a great time to, to start digging into CBT strategies that people can use on their own in early adolescence because there is that ability to start to metacognate and really conceptualize our own mm -hmm. experience. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I hope this has been really helpful for you guys. Thanks so much for joining us. And there'll be a email that gets sent out with a link for how to find us if you want to um, check it out again later on. Thanks so much. Bye, guys.